Thank you very much. I, I want to start really by thanking you, Alison, for interrupting your leave to come and chair our meeting, which is great. And, um, and thank Richard for his leadership in, in getting this uh, booklet together and so enthusiastically promoting these ideas because uh, I think they are really important ideas. Because I think that the current approach for dealing with the sovereign debt crisis in Europe is which is basically has been basically focused on austerity, is bad arithmetic, worse economics, and totally ignores the lessons of history. It's bad arithmetic because uh, really a child in school um, would know that if you have a, a, a fraction and you follow policies that will, uh, that will um, lower perhaps a little bit the, the top part of the fraction, but will also lower uh, the denominator, which is GDP, you would actually increase debt to GDP. So what they're doing is self-defeating uh, in purely arithmetic terms. But of course, it's worse economics because if countries that are trading with each other, and, and of course in the European Union, uh, a very large amount of um, production is for trading with neighboring countries. If they all simultaneously pursue adjustment policies, austerity policies, um, they, that will end up in a vicious circle of all of them having declining GDP, declining demand for each other's products, what uh, Krugman and Stiglitz have called um, collective suicide attempts. So if they all are in this downward spiral of um, um, lowering aggregate demand in each of their economies, it will lead to, the, to this unfortunate outcome, both from economic terms but of course also dramatically in social terms with these very large unemployment numbers that Richard was referring to, 50% of youth unemployment in Spain, <coughs> in Greece. And finally, it ignores the lessons of history because we know this doesn't work. We know it from the 1930s where tragically um, uh, we, we had massive unemployment in the industrial countries and we had massive crises in the developing world. Uh, we know it doesn't, didn't work in the 1980s in Latin America, which as a result of the debt crisis had a lost decade of development. It didn't work in East Asia, and it didn't work in, in Sub-Saharan Africa when it had its crisis. And this is why the adjustment with the human face made, that, that both Francis and, and Richard were co-authors, made such an impact because it started posing the alternative. So now in Europe, there is a beginning of a shift of rhetoric because people are recognizing that this is a problem. And I think that the triumph of Francois Hollande has brought uh, um, greater strength to this argument. But I think the concern is whether the change in rhetoric will lead to a change of a sufficient scale sufficiently quickly uh, to, to make a difference and to avoid this crisis deepening and, um, and, uh, and, and also creating, of course, a, a major cost for the rest of the developing world. And if I have time, I'd like to talk about the impact of this on developing countries, where, of course, ODI has been doing a lot of very good work in the previous phases of the crisis, where up to now, the developing countries have on the whole not suffered so much because they have had buffers. But now these buffers, and even the IMF recognizes this very clearly, these buffers are running out in terms of fiscal space, in terms of uh, having very little debt. And, and so if, if they're hit by another wave of crisis coming from the developed countries, they will again suffer and, and the poverty, the goals of MDGs and so on, of course, will, will, will suffer equally. So what happens in Europe is not only important for Europeans, for Greeks, for Spaniards, but also for, for, for the rest of the world. Um, so I want to focus um, on a sort of alternative strategy to promote growth. And the co-author of my paper and myself were very pleased with ourselves because Hollande has just announced uh, a measure and the numbers and the concepts are very similar to our <laughs> paper. So either we <laughs> think alike or they actually <laughs> saw the paper. So I, I, we're very proud of that. Now they have to do it. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, what you need is measures that are sufficiently big that can be done quickly and where you have leverage of public resources because uh, uh, governments 
have scarce resources and feel very constrained, and the markets keep telling them that they have to be constrained. So one is looking for things that will generate leverage. And so we have thought up some ideas about, which are in some ways are basically just Keynesianism applied to the institutional realities of Europe, which is um, to use the instruments that already exist. One could think of better things to do, but because one has to move quickly, there's a need to better use the structural funds of the EU, where there's a lot of money left over, which is not used because the governments are so fiscally <laughs> constrained that they can't use the programs, and particularly the European Investment Bank. Maybe many of you haven't heard about the European Investment Bank. It's a bank that lends annually about 70 billion euros. It's so it's larger than the World Bank and all the regional development banks put together. It responded very well counter-cyclically in the previous phase of the crisis. But we're suggesting that they will need to do this even more now. And that this would create positive effects in the medium to long term, which we were discussing with Inge, in terms of restructuring the European economy, which is needed to be more green, to be more equalitarian. You need big structural changes, the kind of things that we talk about in developing countries. And at the same time, provide a kind of aggregate demand impetus in the short term to start generating the jobs and the growth that is so needed. Um, so we are talking about a sort of mini, a, a sort of imitation of a Marshall Plan. The Marshall Plan after the Second World War was about 2% of GDP. And it worked very well in kick-starting uh, growth in Europe. And we're talking about a program that will be about half a percent of GDP uh, annually. So we would use the structural funds, uh, a very small part of the EU budget, and I won't go into all the technical details, but the idea is to leverage. So you take 5 billion euros of the EU budget for risk buffer, the EIB doubles that, lends 10 billion, and that would catalyze another 30 billion from the private sector. Because for example, the institutional investors who used to invest in these kind of projects <coughs> can't do it because institutions like the, like the biggest insurance company in the world that used to upgrade these bonds went bust as a result of the crisis, AIG. And so now there is a market gap. So that where, where markets fail, governments have to tread and replace. Them. So this could lead to 40 billion of project bonds. Uh, and the second part, which is, <coughs> perhaps the simplest way is, is a little bit of a trick in the sense that the e European Investment Bank, like all these World Bank and others, has very large paid in total capital, but the paid in capital is only 5%. So it's only 12 billion <coughs> euros. So if you were to double that to another 12 billion euros, uh, as I point out there, which is not a lot because last weekend, not this one, but the previous one, in a phone chat that the finance minister of Europe had, they just agreed 100 billion euros for bailing out the bank, the Spanish banks. So why not use a little bit of money uh, to do actually some useful projects, not just bailing out banks and above all bankers. So with 12 billion euros, uh, you could increase EIB lending uh, over 95 billion Euros because you have a leverage which is allowed by the rating agencies because we're run, today the world is run by, by the rating agencies, not, not mm -hmm. by democratically elected institutions. Uh, so they would allow a, a ratio of say eight. So one could lend 95 billion. And I think there, there's a little bit of a trade-off between whether you want to study very good projects for the long term mm -hmm. or you want to get projects out of the door. And I mm -hmm. think you would need to have some kind of balance between them. But you would have an impressive multiplier because part of this would then be also co-financed either by the private sector or by the national governments or national development banks <laughs> like Germany has a very good, second largest bank in Germany is actually a public development bank. And I think part of the German success is not just lowering wages as, as we are told by conservative economists, but it's also because they have very good training programs, they have very good public banking, they don't have a, a city of London or Wall Street. So, um, so this program, and I won't bore, bore you with the details, 
would add, particularly uh, once it gets going, that is for the next three years, 2013, 2014, 2015, uh, approximately 60 billion euros a year, which is about half a percent of European GDP. And we have a nice graph that goes with it, uh, which shows the same. And then this would have impact uh, of the proposed investment plan. Uh, as I said, the resources are on a scale similar to the Marshall Plan, and we have done some simple modeling. My co-authors have done some simple modeling and shows that the minimum impact of additional growth of EU GDP of 0.6% in two years. These are very modest estimates conservative estimate, and accumulated additional EU jobs of at least 1.2 million people in Europe. Um, this is very conservative. We don't look at the impact via increased EIB lending to the small and medium enterprises, because the EIB goes through private banks and then these lend to, to, um, um, to the SMEs, which of course are starved of working capital, particularly in the crisis countries, countries like Greece, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, they don't have any possibility of <coughs> access because the, mar the banks that overlend in the boom times have, uh, <coughs> are now very risk averse and are very unwilling to lend. So again, it's a case of where markets fail, the public sector must step in uh, in a sort of counter-cyclical Keynesian way. I don't have enough time to talk about how one should think about restructuring the financial sector, as Richard said, to transform it from what it has been, which is a bad master, to a good servant, which is to do its job, to s help to, um, manage risk and that, uh, rather than create risk, mm -hmm. rather than undermine the real economy to support the real economy. Uh, so, but I do want to, and how can I not do it with David Hillman sitting just opposite mm -hmm. me, uh, say, a key part of this is to regulate the financial sector well and also to tax it properly. The, the financial sector, for example, doesn't pay VAT tax. Um, some people say that it's mainly because they don't add very much value. <laughs> <laughs> so we can't measure it. In fact, the bankers say they can't pay VAT because they don't add value. So uh, this idea that we started working uh, with Inga and others. Inga, in fact, uh, led this work uh, many years ago, actually, um, when James Tobin was still alive, um, and did the first in-depth study of the feasibility of a currency transaction tax. And uh, one of the interesting things about these taxes, financial transactions or currency taxes, is that they are actually very feasible. Because in the same way that private bankers can uh, use computers to uh, register the transactions or to avoid um, finance uh, taxes, the, the regulators and the tax authorities can also use the same computer systems. So there is no doubt now about feasibility, and now the argument has shifted that an FTT or a CTT would actually reduce GDP, and that therefore in the crisis we don't want to have a financial. So now what we have argued in a paper with Avinash Prasad is that actually an FTT would not only diminish volatility and discourage future crises, but by doing so would actually increase potential GDP <coughs> in countries like the European countries, because it would make crises less likely. So, um, so that uh, this in an instrument like the financial transaction tax would actually be uh, very useful because it would both try and discourage the very speculative parts in finance, which would free resources for finance for the real economy, together, of course, with other measures, but it would also actually promote growth. Now, as I, as I said at the beginning, why is what is happening in Europe very important for developing countries? It is because if the crisis spins out of control in Europe, uh, there will be inevitably a number of channels through trade, through finance, through remittances, which it will affect the developing world. And as I said, because there are less buffers in, in countries like the low-income countries of Africa, uh, there would be, I think, a very large increase, unfortunately, of poverty, a slowdown of growth. And finally, the people who, the countries that have actually kept the world economy going, 
the, the real Keynesians have been China, Brazil, India uh, in, in, in the previous phase of the crisis, but they themselves are also beginning to slow down as a result of, of, of the crisis in, in, in Europe and the very slow performance in the United States. So it is very crucial to have this alternative uh, for it to happen. And, um, and so therefore, it's also from a developing country perspective very important what happens today in Europe. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much indeed. Thank you very much, Stephanie.